Hi there, everybody. Um, I'm Grant Kennedy. I'm the um, uh, trainer with the Institute of Risk Management uh, on the Risk and Resilience subject. We're just uh, we're actually presenting from the IRM's uh, offices uh, today. So we're just uh, setting up. Hopefully everything's working. We've just got a couple of guys in the room at the moment. So that's us ready to go. Good. I've got a thumbs up. That's, uh, that's everything operational. So everybody should hopefully be able to hear me. Um, no problems with sound from our end. And also... Uh, the slides are, are on your screen and you should be able to see that. So I've got everything in front of me and uh, I've got thumbs up, good to go. So, yeah, as I was saying, I'm Grant Kennedy. I'm uh, one of the, the lead trainers with the Institute of Risk Management. So maybe just a little bit of uh, background uh, on myself and uh, my partnership with uh, myself with, and the IRM. Um, I've worked with the IRM for many years. I um, are one of the form trainers. That's the Fundamentals of Risk Management course. That's the core course that the Institute of Risk Management runs publicly and in-house. I helped develop that a few years back and I run it every every so many months along with uh, other trainers. Uh, that's the core area. Um, also the Institute of Risk Management work closely with uh, myself and Key Risk, that's my company, with uh, the Risk Champions course uh, focused on more of the people side and also the Risk and Resilience uh, course that uh, I'm talking about today. So. I'll take you through the agenda, I'll talk you through uh, where we're going to get to and um, give you a bit more detail. So one other thing I was going to mention was I'm also the mentor in the IRM's diploma programme. The diploma programme, I'm sure many of you people are, to, are listening have, have, have known about the diploma programme, you've maybe been on the form course or certainly the, the certificate course, but the diploma is the full um, Diploma is the, the, the highest level and a core part of that diploma, the, the last module, module six, is the resilience crisis management and future risk. So I'm the mentor on that. I work with a lot of, uh, a lot of the, well, all the students uh, that, that come on that uh, diploma program and help them through uh, understanding what uh, resilience is all about and helping them uh, pass the exams at the end of that. So, so that's my the basics of, of, of who I am, where I've come from in terms of institute risk management. A little bit more around myself personally, um, how I've got here and how I know uh, in my experience around understanding risk and resilience management. Uh, I started a career in uh, Airbus. I became a uh, European uh, risk advisor, uh, working across all countries in, in Airbus, um, involved in quality, safety, environment, health, safety, security, integrated enterprise risk management. Um, a large part of my career as well was uh, Head of Risk at Edinburgh Airport and working across the BAE group, uh, all aspects of um, integrated risk, enterprise management, resilience, continuity, uh, security. I was responsible for that, working very closely with um, civil, under the Civil Contingencies Act in the UK. The Act the Act um, that focuses on uh, civil contingencies, resilience management. Um, so as an airport, they're classed as a Category 2 responder. Emergency services are classed as Category 1. They've got uh, clear responsibilities uh, for risk and resilience management. So yeah, a lot of experience around working in all sorts of sectors, different areas. At the moment, I'm interim head of uh, risk and resilience at uh, a large energy company. Um, I do that uh, a couple of days a week, helping support and build their uh, uh, capabilities and, and frameworks uh, around this area. Um, and of course working in many, many different organisations. A lot of work at, at the moment in the finance sector. I'll touch on a couple of slides later. The finance sector, uh, there's discussion papers uh, out at the moment. Those of you who are in the finance sector, I'm sure you're aware. Um, a lot of focus on resilience is becoming really the prominent uh, topic um, in the finance sector at the moment, led by the Bank of England and the, and the PRA. So discussion papers around operational resilience, they're calling it. So I shall touch on that as well. Um, but just to give you... Uh, a uh, heads up, let's uh, get into the, the slides now um, and um, make make some uh, progress with uh, the webinar. So, obviously, we've done the introduction, so we can move forward. What we're going to look at today is an in introduction to uh, resilience, what's it all about, what are the general expectations on firms, organisations, and also just thinking about uh, resilience at the individual level. The individual is really core to this. It's the people aspect of resilience. Understanding your people is essential because the people make up uh, the ethics, the behaviours, the culture, uh, the resilient culture of, of the organisation are really critical uh, as we move through it. The Institute of Risk Management have done a lot of good work in the past on risk culture, so I'll be touching on some of these sort of areas uh, as, we, as we move through as well. 
So, what is resilience and why is it important? So, resilience is a term that fits with the overall concept of reliability. If you're to remember anything from today, it's probably this little phrase, it's the ability to ad adapt and absorb. That's the term that you see written in international standards for resilience management. There's many, many standards uh, that link into uh, resilience. There are ones in resilience now. There's, there's, there's new ones come out for cyber risk and resilience recently. Uh, you've got business continuity, 22301. Uh, also with the the updates with ISO 31000, the International Standard for, for Risk Management. Resilience is becoming more prominent in there. And also with the uh, update of COSO, uh, the American uh, version, resilience is, is very, very prominent and, and, and uh, explicitly explained within that as well. But what you're seeing is a, is a convergence of international standards where maybe there was in the past differences uh, between a lot of them. Uh, maybe COSO was a bit more internally looking. Uh, ISO 31000 was, you know, looked at the framework, the, the, the principles and the processes associated with it, but you're starting to see more commonality. Uh, one of the reasons for that as well is the supporting um, international standards, say uh, ISO 27001, which focuses on information security uh, risks, uh, whether it's asset management, which is important for resilience in an integrated way. All these different standards um, all have consistent foundations to them now. They all have the pillars, and these pillars are the things that we'll look at in the, in, in the future slides uh, and show you these are the core things that you expect to have in a mature, capable, uh, resilient organization. So really, resilience is a term gaining more attention in recent years, internationally, particularly in regards to the management of natural disasters, uh, man-made disasters in, in countries like Europe, Australia, USA, and Japan, to name a few, uh, developing critical national infrastructure resilience strategies. So, for example, in the context of critical national infrastructure, resilience refers to coordinated planning across sectors and networks to assess future uh, failure probability, consequences, and post-failure activities. It looks at responsive, flexible, and timely recovery measures, really important in those sort of areas. The development of organizational culture that has the ability to provide a minimum level of service during interruptions, emergencies, and disasters and then to return to full operations as quickly as possible. Now that's the core really, it's understanding what's important, what do you do as an organisation, what's your products, what's your services, what are the activities that actually support you delivering what you, you have committed to deliver to your customers. Um, business impact analysis and risk assessment is a core risk assessment tools and techniques uh, that are used to identify that and I'll go into these tools and techniques a little bit later on. So really resilience results in building a, a capacity of organizations to be agile, to be adaptive, and to improve by learning and experience. So really testing. If you've got important areas, if you've got important assets, infrastructure processes, part of the cycle of improvement is to identify them, to have the, the adequate controls in place, but also to make sure that you can test them. So you're not just writing the plans, or you know, you're not just doing the risk assessment. You want to test them live. You want to test them through... Uh, tabletop exercises because it's only then you truly know uh, if you're a resilient organization because you've tested it, you've tried it, people are, have been involved. This slide here shows um, some of the typical foreseeable risks uh, to resilience. Um, I'm sure some of your companies have experienced uh, these. Uh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback in the, the, the phone here, so apologies for that. It's Putting this off slightly, um, we have uh, cyber attacks. We've got cy you know, cyber as, as, as a, one of the largest, highest risks on national risk registers, and it's a growing threat all the time. Privacy and data. So in the UK, we've got the uh, GDPR regulations that have come in. We've got the NIST regulations, uh, potentially resulting in companies with fines up to 20 million um, if they're not managing their information security properly, if they're not properly controlling. Uh, their assets to do with people. So again, resilience and, and, and an overview and integrated approach needs to make sure you identify where these critical areas are, how they're protected and how you respond and inform um, how you set up a major incident if, if, if something goes wrong. So again, yeah, adverse weather can affect us all at different times. We've just seen the, the floods in uh, Mallorca, uh, un unfortunate for a lot of the, the, the tourists and people that live out there, but adverse weather is something that, that is predictable, is foreseeable. Um, 
also disruption in the supply chain. A key part of, of resilience management is once you've identified what's critical to your operations, your activities, so many organi organizations now are dependent on the supply chain, the value chain, and part of the assessments we'll look at during the, the course is, is how do we identify that? How do we then make sure we do adequate due diligence on our supply chain? How do we know those supply chains are, are, are critical, we've prioritized them, but also equally so that those supply chains have a resilient culture themselves? Do they have the continuity plans that support your organization? Some of the key questions that should be thought about. So, yeah, you can see see some of those slides up there. So the benefits of, um, of putting in this effective continuity uh, management system type approach is we know the risks and threats and we can make decisions accordingly. We will have recovery plans in place ranking out our critical activities. We'll be able to think about what our recovery time objectives are, what our maximum tolerable period of disruption is. Now, these are kind of technical terms you hear in continuity language. But basically, it's about thinking about recovery time objective. When do you want to get back up and running to a certain level? Um, it might not be 100%. But how have you planned over time? Because you're starting to look at consequences over time, how it's impacted you, and you need to understand what your tolerance level is linked to your risk appetite. So if th things go wrong, okay, it's going to affect potentially safety, and then it's going to affect finance, and then it's going to affect reputation. Different consequences can happen over time depending on the different uh, threat events that, that, that can happen. But the maximum tolerable period of disruption is, is the, the time when you can't really... Uh, Doing more that that's 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 it. You, you you can't go beyond that because your company fails. Everything fails. That that's the the worst case scenario which you don't want to get to. So these plans and continuity management system structure provide top management uh, with resilience and confidence, also to be able to seek higher risk opportunities. This slide here is from the the British standards. Uh, I work closer with um, with. British standards, um, they are the, the, the leading standards provider uh, that, that, that write the standards. Uh, in the past, uh, the, the, the standard for resilience was a BS 65,000. That's now evolved into to the new international standards. But this slide comes from some of the, the work they've done with um, the leading universities. Um, but what it, it does, hopefully it shows quite clearly where they think the key priorities are around organizational resilience. Certainly I agree with, with this, certainly when I work with various different companies, it's really important to build upon this and it captures everything in one image. So in the middle, it's saying you know, organizational resilience is the center, that's where you want to get to. But the key elements here of the key words is product, process, and people. So the product is you've really got to understand what it is you do, what your products and services are. Um, in this context, products refers to whatever product, service, or solution an organization brings to the market. Organizations must ask themselves which markets they serve, do its capabilities and products match those market requirements, and comply with the regulatory environment. And if not, how can I adapt them? So truly resilient businesses innovate, creating new products and markets, and differentiating, differentiating their offering to stay ahead of their competitors. So that's what products look like. So when you're doing a business impact analysis, the starting point is what's your core products and services, what's the activities that support the delivery of that. Then you start to look into the dependencies, the supply chain, the systems that support it. Are all these things integrated? Are we aware that they are adequate in place uh, to make sure they work in normal operations? But equally so, if something goes wrong, what are the plans to get them back and withstand the worst as quickly as possible? So really, it's about understanding your business as a, as a core. The processes are the, are the, the process reliability is embedding best practice into developing and marketing products and services. It's a key component of success. So resilient organizations ensure that they do the basics right consistently through the strength and reliability of their processes, while still leaving scope for innovation and creativity. So business critical processes in the management of areas such as quality processes, environmental processes, health safety, information security, business continuity, everything that they're doing, trying to understand the processes, your risk management processes that flow through all of these. And that's a great thing now with these international standards coming together, whether you're looking at quality, which my background was way back in Airbus, I've done health and safety degrees, so now there's, there's, there's health and safety uh, International management system, and the international management system for health and safety, which is 45,000. You've got ISO 14001 for environment, 
27,001 for information security and business continuity, which is the core area that we're looking at here, 22,301. All these things, as I said at the start, all integrate, but the key thing is ISO 31000, the risk process, each and every one of them refer back to the risk management process, the fundamentals of, of, of risk management flow all the way through it. That's the processes. So once you've, you've, you understand what you do, what the processes are around supporting it, the people aspect is absolutely critical. So people from all different aspects, you need to understand who your people are, what they do, um, how we build that culture around it, but also during a major incident, how do we support, how do we look after the welfare of our own people? Um, there's, again, there's, there's a lot more guidance coming out of that, which we, we delve into in the course as well. How do you make sure you understand your people and you look after them. So resilient organisations really seek alignment between customer expectations and employee engagement. Uh, they're inclusive, they're consultative, and it's not simply dictating rules to be followed, but encouraging employees' behaviour to become an integral part of their job and their organisation's culture. So really, are people's ethics aligned to the organisation's ethics? We have tools and techniques that can actually understand people. We can understand their ethics, what gets them out of the bed in the morning, what drives them, what drives their behaviours, how they like to be communicated to, how they don't like to be communicated to. These are the sort of tools that we use to, in lots of our organisations we work with to really understand the individual. If you don't understand the individual doing the roles, you can't understand uh, the, the culture truly. Another core part of people uh, resilience risk management is understanding the critical roles that people do. Uh, this is generally called um, insider threat. I work a lot with uh, critical national infrastructure with governments, um, to, especially in the energy sector at the moment, to make sure we do understand the critical roles in the organisation. Where's those key risk roles? Procurement directors, IT directors, people that could potentially be vulnerable, corrupted, that have uh, ability to, uh, you know, uh, wrong things could, could happen. So you need to be thinking about what are the controls we have around those roles that's the core risk assessment process, but then the layer below that, what I've just touched on, is understanding these people. Who are these people in these roles? Do we properly understand them? So people plays a, a, a massive part in all this um, area of building an integrated resilience approach. This slide kind of captured it, because at the start I said the ability to absorb and adapt. Now you're only able to absorb and adapt if you've done all the proactive work. You've done the risk assessments, you've understood where the threats are, you understand where the controls are. That's looking at the likelihood and consequences. The business impact analysis merges the two. But the continuity aspect is, okay, things have happened, things have gone wrong, consequences have happened. So continuity doesn't worry so much about the likelihood of events, it's more worried about something's gone wrong. What plans have we got to... to get back up and running to get our critical services, our critical products, our, kit, our critical assets back and running. Maybe if I give an example, when I was uh, at the airport at, uh, at Edinburgh, we identified our critical assets as the runway, the, the flight information display um, systems, the terminal building. These are some of the things. And it doesn't matter so much from the continuity point of view what caused that to stop. Obviously, risk management, we needed to understand that and make sure that we had the controls in place, the layers of defence, you tend to call it. But if the terminal went, if the runway went, what was our contingency? What plans did we have in place to, to go and rebuild potential building? Because it could have got taken out from loads of different reasons, loads of different threats back from the first few, few slides. It could be um, terrible, extreme weather. It could be fires, it could be floods, it could be terrorist attacks. There could be so many different things, black swan events, things that you're just not, no idea of knowing. But the main thing was you knew it was important and you knew you had the plan in place to get it back up and running. So, for example, at the airport, we knew that we could rebuild a temporary terminal within a couple of weeks that could get us back up to an acceptable level of resumption of services. Not 100%, but getting us back quickly. And if we hadn't done that proactive work, um, we, we wouldn't be able to do that, but also when you do this proactive work, you start to understand the business in a lot more detail. You can start to see gaps and uh, in, inefficiencies as well using the business impact and risk assessment together. So that slide is trying to show enterprise risk management. It's a, it's a term that's evolving very, very rapidly. It, you know, it, it's nothing particularly new. It's integrated uh, management, but the enterprise risk management feeds into understanding your business and understanding continuity at the same time. So the journey 
really towards organisational resilience begins with a shared commitment towards an organisation's vision, its strategic goals and operational objectives, supported by a sound understanding of strategy and plans to achieve the desired outcomes. So this commitment is strengthened by a desire to effectively protect the organisation from risks that threaten those objectives in any time in a continually changing and complex environment. And similar to the way that risk management has evolved from you know, the purchase of insurance a long time ago, business continuity has evolved to merge to fit into the enterprise strategic integrated framework as well. So it's really bringing these uh, two disciplines together with a lot of overlap in between. Okay, so what, what we just touched on is what if risks do become a crisis? What if we are affected? What if um, <clears throat> things do go wrong? What this slide here is showing the, 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 the continual loop of business continuity. So if risks do become a crisis, business continuity provides a framework for business resilience, ensuring that processes continue to operate with sufficient robustness in the event of an incident and are recovered before a crisis occurs. So business continuity management involves managing recovery and con continuation of business activities in the event of a business disruption, and management of the overall program through training, exercising and reviewing to ensure business, continu <coughs> <excuse> me, <coughs> business continuity plans stay current and up to date. So what are some of the benefits uh, to this? So you can see in the slide here, see, these are some of the benefits that we feel um, an integrated resilience uh, approach brings improves efficiency of operations because you understand your operations, you've actually mapped them out from the most important ones all the way through the organisation. You've got a clear understanding of interactions, dependencies, not only from um, uh, individual departments, but also from the supply chain as well. And the supply chain is a really critical area uh, to make sure that uh, you understand where they're supporting, how they're supporting the information. It reduces surprises because you know the things that can potentially affect you, you know the controls you've got around it, but also you can get back up and running quicker because you've tried and tested that you've exercised some of these foreseeable risks. Obviously, this all comes together to give you enhanced decision making at the, at, at the various levels, whether it's tactical, whether it's uh, operational levels on, on, on the ground, or whether it's strategic. Um, all these uh, different approaches help build this. Um, ensures adequate governance and standards. You know, it, it brings the governance together. It means that you have the, the correct framework. So if you build the framework adequately, how are you measuring it? How are you making sure that the strategy is really clear? It flows through. You've understood the risks. You've got the, the, the measurements that help support it. Um, really, all this is trying to do is maximize opportunities, opportunities and minimize threats. That's the basis of how we, how we try to operate. The outcome of that, is obviously improved reputation. If, if uh, organisations know that you have embedded a, a mature, capable, um, integrated structure, they're much more confident to, to work with you. And also, if things do go wrong, they can see how quickly you can respond to instances as well. They can have more confidence working with your organisation in the future. That brings competitiveness, because you know, being able to continue from, uh, in the past, recover and learn from where appropriate capitalize uh, upon opportunities presented by disruptions can increase value uh, better than competitors that are less resilient. So you might be in a marketplace where something has hit you, you know, recent uh, events in the finance sector where um, uh, credit cards have been down, organizations are, who had the plan in place were able to work a lot uh, better together. So the other really key benefit here is, is bringing coherence. If you can build a coherent structure, people know what's expected of them, there's clear roles and responsibilities uh, at every level, from the board level, setting the tone from the top, the sponsors that sponsor resilience, all the way through to the, the risk and resilience uh, champions uh, down to that as well, people uh, owning, uh, uh, being responsible for their own plans, you know, they've conducted the risk assessments and continuity plans with the relevant uh, risk and continuity departments, I mean, what I'm seeing now is more and more of these departments becoming more integrated and, and, and being called uh, the, the resilience uh, uh, departments as well. So that brings uh, coherence. Also, obviously, it brings efficiency and effectiveness. Working with coherent and integrated framework has time and cost saving implications. The resilience framework meshes together, drives components, allocating resources to improve overall resilience and ultimately efficiency and effectiveness and, and operation.
as I mentioned right at the start, the finance sector has a, those of you, we know, we know the IRM has a, a lot of um, uh, working in the finance sector. Certainly I know from some of the people on the, uh, the, the diploma um, uh, working in the finance sector. So those of you in that sector will be aware that there's a discussion papers out at the moment. Um, and really the focus on this is from the Bank of England. And they, and they coined the phrase operational resilience uh, back in 2015. Certainly the thoughts and evolution of, of resilience in this sector is, is evolving at the moment. That's why the discussion paper is out. But a lot of it is based on the basic principles that we've just been talking about, the basic principles coming from these international standards, linking to risk management, linking to the standards that are out there. And um, what, what the, the, the key uh, phrase is, an organization's ability to protect and sustain its core business functions experience an operational stress or disruption. Now this is probably going to become the biggest thing in the finance sector, certainly for the focus over the next uh, five to ten years from the regulators' wellbeing. They want to make sure that uh, you know, all organisations in the finance sector are capable, understand their processes, making sure that their processes support their customers' needs. All these areas that are getting developed uh, more and more. Um, some of the, the discussions from Bank of England key phrases we're coming out from thinking about when, not if, circumstances change. So it's not about this is something not to worry about, you know, you know, these these events that we talked about, these foreseeable risks might never happen to you. It's about they're most likely to happen with you and they expect organizations to have the plans in place even if they don't. So some of the, the detail coming from this is where they've tried to define operational resilience, what it means. This term might evolve as well. You know, we've been talking about wider organisational resilience, and you saw from the British standard slide before, operational resilience is a key part of that. So the, the, the two definitions merge, but we are, in this uh, particular training course, in this particular webinar, we're thinking holistically the whole organisation, organisational resilience from top to bottom, side to side, and including the extended enterprise, the value chain as well. But what it does do, and this is some of the things that uh, the regulators in the finance sector have been uh, focusing in on, they're saying it integrates incident management. And we're going to touch on incident management at the end of this webinar, thinking about what incident management plans you have in place, what responsibilities have you got uh, during a crisis, have your, do you have a, a major incident team, uh, what do they do, do they know what they're supposed to do, do you ever try and test that? Um, We'll touch on that later. Other things like physical security, cyber security, your resilience framework, your governance structures, your service operations, your capability management. Do you know what maturity level you're at at the moment? Do you know where you want to get to? These are some of the things to be thinking about. Obviously, risk management flows through all of this, as does change management and continuity management. So those are just some of the, the, the areas of focus uh, in the finance sector. Now, that's not any different from other regulators we work with. I work with Off-GEM. Off they focus on resilience as well and have done for some time. It's certainly working with the critical national infrastructure. None of this is, is new whatsoever. This has been around for a long time and uh, a lot of some organizations I work with are a lot more mature uh, than others. Um, but that's just because various various different reasons for that. But you know, the the, the, the level of maturity is um is certainly different in different industries. So why implement a resilience approach, a resilience philosophy? Is it just to comply with the regulator? Hopefully not just that, but that, that might be a baseline. Certainly when you look at integrated risk and resilience frameworks, one of the core things to do, once you are really articulated what you do, your core products and services, your core activities, <coughs> you want to understand what legal and other requirements are um, applicable to you. And, and one way to do that is build a a RACI diagram, um, so you, you would look at your core departments, um, you look at the legislation affecting them, you look at the activities they're doing, and a RACI, for those that have never used it, is, is defining who's responsible, who's accountable, who's consulted, and who needs to be informed. It's a really good way of bringing things together to actually go, you know, your policy might say we will be legally compliant, but that is a, a relatively easy way, and it's a, a lot of hard work at the start, but once you've brought it together, you can truly understand how you're mapping against legal compliance, uh, legal capability. So that brings all the different departments together and understanding what different laws are applicable, whether they're health and safety, whether they're environmental, whether they're GDPR, or whatever they are, or you might have sector-specific um, 
uh, responsibilities, regulations, uh, maybe insurance requirements as well. But bringing this together in a central point is important because then you can truly understand if you're being compliant or not. But we want to be more than, well, a lot of organisations want to be more than just compliant. They want to be agile. You want to be Italy, you're competitors, you want to be on the front foot. That's what um, proactive risk management is, and it's making sure you're identifying the opportunities when you need to. And if things do go wrong, you have improved risk and response. So things go wrong, you've got response. You're future proofing your organization's place in the market and are able to break into to new market areas. So remember that uh, you need to be able to take risk, survive, and thrive. Those that don't take risks in an organization, probably not moving forward, you're probably stagnating, moving back. Every organization needs to take risks all the time. And bearing risk and continuity thinking into the ever existing processes and integration from new projects right to become embedded into the really into the operational rhythm of the organization. You want this to be happening day to day, operationally, tactically, strategically. Everything you're looking at supports the achievement of your mission and your vision. So what's the sort of things that's expected? What's the sort of frameworks that's expected for organizations to become capable and, and become, become resilient? As I said before, resilience is the term that fits with the overall concept of reliability, the ability to adapt and absorb. I'm just going to show you a slide with um, some international standards that have resilience uh, in it. So, we have 22316, that's the, the resilience standards. You had the old British standard, 65,000, which uh, focused on uh, resilience management. Um, have ISO 31,000, the resilience is referred to in there. 22,301, that's the, that's the business continuity standard. So there's a whole load out there, and the list goes on and on and on. But what we've done in the course is made sure we've reviewed every single one in a lot of detail. We've took, taken out the core elements of every single one and tried to give you the basics and the building blocks for the areas that we feel is, is absolutely core to have in place. So this image is based on Plan Do Check Act. All these international standards are based on this. There's actually an, an overall standard which is called Annex SL, uh, which means these standards are all becoming much more like I'm not going to go into the detail of this. This is what we do in the course and we build the exercises. We actually build a, a scenario all the way through, a case study, and we actually make sure we cover each of these elements. But just so you're aware for your own organisations, if you are thinking about building a, a kind of structured framework, this would probably be a good place to start. Plan Do Check Act. Um, the new language that's coming into line with Plan Do Check Act, because Plan Do Check Act really is... Uh, Focused on the basics, focused on the compliance requirements. Um, you have more dynamic resilience language coming through now, which is which are the words are foresight, insight, oversight, hindsight. So it's the foresight models. This has evolved from British standards as well, and it's really quite a good approach. I, I really like the language because foresight is meaning you're looking forward. You're, you know, you're aligning to your strategy and your vision. Your you know your your focus of where you're going as a business. You're doing your horizon scanning, you're understanding what's out there. The insight part is understanding your activities. The business impact analysis helps support that. What is it you do? What's your core products and services, like I mentioned before? And oversight is, is the governance. You know, how do you govern this adequately? And hindsight starts to look at, you know, have you got adequate incident response management? Do you do root cause analysis? And have you got appropriate um, auditing based on the key risk areas? All these sort of things come together. But to, to, to come back to this, so this is where they, they, they cross over. So Plan Do Check Act, linking with the foresight model, is, is a good way to build uh, an approach to being dynamic and flexible with, uh, with resilience. But the core pillars here would be context, leadership, planning, support, operation, performance, evaluation, and improvement. You can see in the slides below, these are everything uh, aligned to that. This is actually a summary of the continuity standards all the way through. So, again, we don't have time to, to go through all this in any detail, but that's um, that's how we look at building a core structure. Again, evolving on from um, some of the work done by Bank of England, the FCA, and the PRA, this is what they think. That the 
players are. So identify the most important business services and how much disruption can be tolerated in what circumstances. Map the systems and processes <coughs> that support the business services. Assess how the failure of individual systems or processes can impact the business. Using scenarios by learning from experience that resilience meets the firm's tolerance. Invest in ability to respond and recover from disruptions through having appropriate systems, oversight and training. <coughs> and communicate timely information to internal stakeholders, supervisory authorities, customers, counterparties and other market participants. Nothing particularly new there. Key sensible stuff that they're advising to look at. Key, key things that link back to the basics of the international management systems I've just mentioned. So one of the, the areas maybe to draw out on in here is the um, stakeholders. Certainly an uh, approach that we, we take uh, when, we, when we look is trying to map out, as we've already said, what you do, corporate services. But linked to that is dependencies. Who are your key stakeholders internally and externally? Certainly something we did particularly well at the airport after a certain period of time is thinking about who is it externally that we need to, to, to be talking to? Who's the, the, the executives with the account management? Who needs to be talking to the government? Who needs to be talking more regularly to the emergency services? Who needs to be talking to our communities around us? But actually, when you haven't mapped that out, you're probably in a place where you don't quite know you're managing your stakeholders' expectations well enough from your own point of view, but also from the stakeholders' point of view. So that would be one of the things I would recommend in a, a building into your framework as well, identifying them first of all, and then identifying key uh, management, or not necessarily always management, but key people in your organisation that build and maintain that relationship, even that intelligence back into your risk reporting, ultimately build resilience, build partnerships and engagement as well, comes from that sort of approach. Achieving effective resilience, where we think the key areas are, linking back to all these different reviews of the international standards from all the work that we've done in various different organisations, from reviewing a lot of what the, the, the regulator is saying in different industries, when you break it down, the, the key elements are in front of you on the page here. So encourage a good risk culture, assign appropriate resources, establish governance, understand the context of the organisation, has your appetite been made clear? Align and agree strategy and objectives back to that. Implement the organisational and oper resilient, operational resilience processes. Up to bottom, communication. How do you escalate, cascade information going up and down, consolidate risk information, and use this performance information, linking performance with strategy. One of the key areas that COSO is looking at now, the, the balance between strategy and performance. It's really important to have the two things aligned and the risks are the things that... Uh, that help you achieve meeting your strategy opportunities or the threats, the things that stop you um, and meeting your strategy as well. So having that information really clear and articulated is really important. And obviously bringing this together through your performance monitoring review, management review meetings at whatever level they need to be. And that just links into a continual improvement cycle to improve risk and resilience at all levels of the organisation. So I'm just going to go into a couple of other slides to, to bring this to a conclusion. We've got about uh, 15 minutes to go. So we've covered a lot of the, the theory. We're now just going to give you a bit more of an example into the reasons of looking at impact over time, the reasons that the business impact analysis is the tool to help you uh, improve responses uh, and understand uh, what's going on. So really you start to look at what your overall organisation is first. So if you look at this slide here, hopefully not too complicated, what we're trying to show here is that impacts over time without a BIA, and I'm going to show you the next slide, when you have done a BIA, when you have got appropriate plans in place. So you can imagine your organisation as a living, breathing organism. It's got lots of different activities, it's got lots of different things that you're doing, just like the human being. So we're looking on the left side of the screen, we are working at normal operation. Things are fine. We have key um, activities, key processes, or if you like, if you want to describe it that way within our body, one is which is the heart, right? So this incident, this event that's happened, we've had a heart attack, we've had a cardiac arrest, right? Okay, so the timeline goes from zero. After one minute, the brain cells begin to die, but survival is possible. Three minutes, serious brain damage unlikely. 10 minutes, brain cells have died, recovery unlikely. 
and after 15 minutes, you know, recovery is virtually impossible. So it's death. That's the maximum tolerable period. So you, there's key timescales, there's key consequences you're going along here. You, we know what the critical asset is, we know what fits within the overall organisation, which is the, the human body. No continuity plans in place, not a great place to be. We haven't analysed it, we haven't understood what needs to be in place to help us respond and get things back to normal as quickly as possible. So the next slide shows hopefully a different scenario. We have understood our organisation, we have understood you know, heart attack as a possible thing, and we have understood the consequences over time. And we've tried to put remediation measures in place to be able to support this, this uh, risk event that's materialised. 9999, the people know who to call. There's their facilities, there's their phone lines. Some organisations have their own emergency response uh, on site. Uh, you have your own emergency numbers. But again, people need to be aware of that. People need to be able to know to call that and also the facility to be able to do it. If you've got a CPR, um, you have defibrillators. You know, having that in place at the recovery time objective, that's where you're trying to make sure you, know, you are making sure that that's in place, that there's somebody responded. You've had to think about training first aiders because you know this is a potential risk that can happen. First aiders are in place. That's part of your continuity response, your emergency response plans. Um, defibrillators are there. The ambulance. So a lot of organisations that I work with, especially uh, you know, airports, aviation, and large manufacturing sites, work closely with the emergency services. One, because they have to, but also more importantly, because having a close relationship with emergency services is extremely important. Um, so if uh, the, the ambulance was to arrive, they didn't know where to go. Time is of the essence here. The, the time is so critical. So if you have worked with the emergency services, if you have clear routes for them to come into an airport or an or, or energy company site, they've mapped it out, they've been there before, they've tested it, they, there's clear parking arrangements. Everything is as slick as possible to ensure that person has the best chance of survival or that operation that's been affected, whatever it is, has the best chance of, of recovery in place. With this particular example, the BIA, the pre-work that we've done, has allowed us to make sure we've got all the key bits in places. Uh, and, and in this situation, the person has recovered, uh, goes through occupational health and comes back to work. So it's a good outcome. But that's what you want. That's what, because we've been proactive, we've understood what's going on and we've got proactive plans in place. The next slide looks at incident management. It's absolutely critical for um, organisations to be uh, responsive and be resilient. Now, the business impact analysis and continuity plans are absolutely important, but what I'm trying to think about here is the overall uh, incident management process. That a lot of organisations call it gold, silver and bronze. Um, some of you may not have heard that term. Certainly it comes from emergency services and, and, and the army as well. Um, but it's used across sectors. Um, but really what it means is a major incident goal is, is the highest level. It's your strategic team, it's your exec team. And what's important here is to make sure that um, the exec team know what roles and responsibilities they've got. Have you, as your business within your integrated risk management framework, have you actually written a document? Have you tested it? Have you tried it? And some of the things that would be in that document would be um, roles and responsibilities for the, the lead. Who's the chair of the major incident team? What do they do? And what you tend to see in, in good plans, um, it might be a pull out at the back, it might be 10 key points, because when an emergency or crisis is happening, people could potentially flap. But if you've planned, if you've prepared, if they know what they're supposed to be doing, they follow uh, key key steps. And again, doing it in an agile and dynamic and flexible way is important. It's a better uh, chance to not miss anything and to make the right decisions. So a chair, would have particular roles. So might, who's the lead for welfare? The person that's looking at the welfare of all your organisation, all your stakeholders, but equally the welfare of your major incident team themselves, because sometimes when a crisis happens, time passes very, very quickly. You, you, you know, I've been in incidents where you know, 24 hours have passed quickly, so you need somebody to be able to stand back and go, Look, we need to plan people to take breaks, where are they going to sleep, what hotels have we got booked, you know, all these sort of things, the welfare, the, the food, nourishing the people to keep them going, you know, food and drink, all that sort of stuff is important. So welfare would have clearly defined roles. Also, you tend to see communication roles in there. You know, how do we make sure that we're communicating in an incident in a coherent, structured way? What we don't want is one part of the business saying something and the other saying something else. We need this to be brought together to make sure coherent communication 
and consistent communication is put out at the appropriate time. You don't want to be over communicating either. So the flow of information, so the information's happened, uh, the events happened, you need to have incident response plans in place. They are the people that get out on the, the ground. So let's use the airport example again. That would be your emergency teams, two minute responses, cordon the area, sort things out, communicate back up to the terminal manager at silver tactical level and communicate in both ways between the silver and the, and the, and the gold to make strategic decisions. Um, the operational teams, if you have to invoke your continuity plans, a lot of com companies now are using um, uh, management systems, uh, system software to manage your continuity. Uh, you know, that, that is not always advisable. It might not be appropriate for some smaller organizations, but I would suggest that most organizations should be considering integrating software solutions now uh, to be able to manage this, to be able to, to send a send X call trees, uh, texts out to out to your team to let them know what's going on. That's a key tool, an enabler to be able to communicate when things have gone wrong. Um, okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, where BIA and the, and the major incident teams fit together. One more slide, I've probably covered most of the elements of that, but just what it's showing here is major incident plans, you know, confirm, contain, communicate. The goal is the strategic level. You're looking at escalation up the way, direction down the way, from incident management plans all the way down to your continuity plans as well. So we're just going to finish up uh, very briefly on the, the role of culture and, and individuals in that culture um, with a, a, a resilient culture, basically. So what we're looking at here is culture is made up of a lot of things. Um, it's made up of stories, symbols, paradigms, power, tools and routines. But the key thing for me really is trust and t transparency. Management should actively build trust with internal and external stakeholders we've already touched on. Employees in the organisation should have opportunity to do the right things in the right place at the right time in the right way in order to create an environment of trust and transparency. So clearly defined expectations of behaviour, clear channels of communication, no blame culture. Um, I've got a, a couple of notes here from the Institute of Risk Management on what a good risk culture is. So you guys are listening, think about well, what do you, what would you like your, your risk culture to be like? Do you feel that it's mature, immature? Wherever you are in, in, in terms of um, developing this, there's, there's key elements that, that, that you should be thinking about. One of them is a, a consistent, a distinct and consistent tone from the top, from the board and senior managers, in respect to risk taking and avoidance. You know, is that set, is that tone uh, consistent is there, out there? A commitment to ethical principles, reflected in a concern for the ethical profile of individuals, application of ethics and the consideration of wider stakeholder positions and decision making, common acceptance through the organisation of the importance of continual uh, risk and resilience management, including clear accountability for ownership in specific risks and areas, transparent and timely risk information flowing up and down the organisation, with bad news rapidly communicated without fear or blame, um, encouragement of risk events and reporting, seeking uh, to learn from mistakes and near misses. Um, no process or activity too large or too complex or too obscure. The risk to be readily understood. And, and also appropriate risk-taking behaviours rewarded and encouraged. And inappropriate behaviours challenged and sanctioned. Uh, risk management skills and knowledge valued, encouraged and developed uh, with, with properly resourced um, functions. Professional qualifications. Uh, also sufficient diversity of perspectives and values and beliefs. Because in, a, in an organization, we do a lot of work in the people risk side of things. We've got tools that can actually understand the ethics of individuals, how people think, ultimately how that influences the behavior, how those ethics are aligned to the organization's uh, ethics. So that's part of uh, the area that we look into uh, in the course as well, because everybody has personal predisposition to risk. People have different views. That's when you're starting to look and develop risk assessment and doing the business impact analysis. Is you should try and do it with um, with more than one person. You should be looking at doing it in a team because some people might think that one risk is, is, is a lot higher than the other, but actually they might have a skewed perception of that. An example of that might be a fire risk. Somebody may have had a family member hurt or potentially killed in a fire. They could potentially have a, a higher uh, value uh, uh, when they're looking at likelihoods and consequences of a fire. 
that's why it's so important to, to understand the individual, to understand the individual in the roles and understand the individual for themselves, those personal ethics, those behaviours that make up the, the organisational culture. So thank you for your time uh, today. That's where we're, we're going to finish off. Um, so hopefully that was uh, of uh, some interest and um, it gave you uh, uh, encouragement to, to contact the Institute of Risk Management and um, speak to them uh, about more of what we can do to help uh, training, awareness, any of these sort of things. And also, obviously, we've got the, the public course, which is available to you. So thank you for your time. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. I can see if I can actually see if there's any else. Maybe we can do that. But um, any, any questions that have been asked, I'll be able to feed back directly to, to you guys um, if we've got your contact details. And uh, more than happy to do that and have a chat as well. So thank you for your time and um, hopefully see some of you soon. Thank you. Bye.